As the Democratic Party recovers from its unexpected defeat in the 2016 election, it finds itself in search of new leaders who can bring the party through this time of crisis. History shows this is possible, but how did the oldest continuous political party in American history find itself on the verge of irrelevance? And what are the historic precedents for where the party finds itself today? We asked Boston University history professor Dr. Bruce Shulman to guide us through the history of the Democratic Party. I'm Bob Crawford. And I'm Ben Sawyer, and this is The Road to Now. And The Road to Now has brought me to Pompano Beach, Florida, where I'm I'm back to work, uh, getting ready to do sound check here. You may hear a kick drum in the background being uh, being checked out. Uh, so if you hear any background noise, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a working environment. That's right. Bob and I are both back in working environments. And it's, it's interesting because we both had some time off uh, from having to be anywhere for the last few months. And I've been back to school now for a couple of weeks. Loving my classes. It's funny, it, you know, when I get a break over, over Christmas, get to go home and see my family and everything, it's wonderful. But when I get back to, to classes, I'm so much happier. I love my I love my university and I love my students. And uh, Bob has even more people in attendance whenever he goes on in front of a crowd. <laughs> and it's just we're both. I think we're both lucky. It is definitely a contrast to uh, being at home and uh, being with my family, and then you go to work and then you're. You're walking out in front of thousands of people. We had over 3,000 people last night in, wow. in Tampa. And um, you don't realize like you have to mentally prepare yourself to be in front of that many people at one time. It's a, there, there's an, an anxiety to it. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, and it's, it's very comfortable doing it for 16 years now. It's very comfortable. But there is a, a mental... You know, that first time you've been off for months and then you walk out in front of 3,000 people and it's just like it takes a a little bit, it takes a few minutes to kind of get acclimated (laughs) again. Uh, You know, you don't feel as free as you do when you're, you know, at home, obviously, but but it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's good. It's good to be back to work. Yeah, and it's always interesting to like hear people, you know. It's like when I go back into my first uh, into a new semester as well, like I feel a, a bit overwhelmed, a bit intimidated, you know, uh, in the same way. It's like, but I've been doing this for, you know, over a decade now, too. But I think I was talking to somebody the other day uh, about you should always be worried if you're not if you, if you think you're really good at something like you should always be worried because it means that you don't have the hunger anymore. Every time I think I'm getting good at something is when I pretty much fall flat on my face. So <laughs> yeah. that is good. That is a positive thing. So hopefully that will keep happening for the rest of my life. Yeah. And this, this week's been a big week, too. I mean, we're, we, we spoke last week with uh, John Jarvis from the National Park Service. And in our introduction, uh, we reminded everybody that the resistance to what was going on with the Trump administration was just beginning to form. And we've seen the first, I think, the first big indicator of that with the judge in Washington uh, ruling that the executive order on immigration is unconstitutional and that's a big deal and when we look at this resistance uh some people are wondering what's the democratic party doing and there's been a lot of finger pointing going on and uh, i think that we'll be in a better spot whenever the democrats begin to point that finger back at themselves and begin to ask themselves what did they do wrong not what did everyone else do to us and so we wanted to take this opportunity to put this in historical context and we got a great guest on today's show uh bob why don't you tell us about uh, about the guest for today before i do that ben a big part of this show is asking the question who is the leader of the democratic party you know they had right. a had a terrible defeat a, a, i mean not a landslide trump did not have a landslide victory in any historical context but the unexpectedness of it kind of made it very much like a political earthquake, like a national earthquake. And so right. people have been asking, who is the leader of the Democratic Party? It's got to be someone who's in power, who holds a position of power right now. And really, given the people that switched, the people from Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin who voted for Barack Obama and then in the 2016 election switched their vote for Donald Trump, it can't be an, an Eastern elite. 
can't be somebody from New York or Massachusetts, and it can't be somebody from California. So it needs to be some someone who's in power from another part of the country. And what we're seeing in the early hours of the fight over this uh, this Muslim ban, uh, travel ban, what, whatever you want to call it, um, we see a couple of Democrats kind of rising up in that they are they are being the tip of the spear of the resistance against uh, some of Trump's policy. And we see in Washington state, Governor Jay Inslee has been uh, uh, leading the charge. And he's a Democrat that could, through this groundswell of opposition to Trump and his policies, he may be a Democrat to watch over the next couple of years because he's he's outside of Congress and he's in a position to directly take on Trump. Yeah, and I want to I want to just give a public service announcement to uh, any of our friends who are Democrats. Uh, you know, recent history suggests uh, that you better run somebody with some charisma. <laughs> you know, this is the thing that is. It's kind of watching people look back at this election. I don't know. It's, it's kind of confusing to me that nobody has gone. What do Bill Clinton and Barack Obama have in common that John Kerry, Al Gore, and Hillary Clinton lacked? And I think, you know, from a very base level, it's, it's, it's charisma. And so, Democrats, if you're listening, if you want to win this one, I think you should just look at that basic formula. There's more to it, but it's worth, it's worth paying attention to. Yeah, and if uh, a couple weeks before you announce you're, you're running for president, there is an email scandal that appears <laughs> on the cover of the New York Times, you may want to reconsider running. Yeah, or at least address it, handle it well, yeah. maybe. maybe. It was just... Uh, <laughs> We look back on it now and it's just baffling. I mean, the most qualified person to be president and one of the worst candidates running for president. And that's just, it's very sad. It's very sad. To shed more light on this subject, we were so fortunate to speak with Bruce J. Shulman, who's chair of the Department of History at Boston University. He's also a contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, and LA Times. And he's uh, consulted on programs on History Channel, ABC, and PBS. He gave us tremendous insight into the historical coalitions that have made up the Democratic Party going back to the 1820s. I'm really happy that we've been able to get these guests on to speak about the two parties because both uh, Dr. Heather Cox Richardson, who we had on about the Republican Party, and Dr. Shulman just did incredible jobs of walking us you know, from the president, from the present back to the origins of the party and explaining how these... You know, these questions we have, like how was the South solidly Democratic and then suddenly became solidly Republican within a short time? Uh, you know, how did the Democratic Party that was the party that was, the, you know, that, that supported slavery the most fiercely during the, you know, the antebellum era? How does that become the party that runs the first successful black president, presidential candidate? And so these are good questions we have, and Dr. Shulman really did a great job, and we really appreciated having him on, and we're happy and excited we get to share this interview with you. Bruce Shulman, welcome to The Road to Now. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Bruce, in the days leading up to the 2016 election, everyone was talking about how fractured the Republican Party was. Most pollsters and pundits expected Hillary Clinton to win, the Democrats to recapture the Senate, and for the Republicans to spend this period in the wilderness, searching for new leadership, searching for a new identity. Well, unexpectedly, Hillary Clinton lost. Democrats failed to recapture the Senate. Brings me to my first question to you here today. Who is the leader of the Democratic Party? Uh, well, the Democratic Party doesn't have a leader right now. But of course, there have been many periods in the history of both parties in which the parties have kind of wandered in the wilderness after either overwhelming defeats, as in the case of some of the historic landslides, or after unexpected defeats like that, like we saw in 2016. So right now, there is a battle for the leadership of the Democratic Party. There certainly is a battle for the heart and soul of the party. The party finds itself in, a, in some ways 
in a position that it hasn't been in for a long time, really not since the Great Depression of the 1930s, has the Democratic Party been such an out party, a minority party in both houses of Congress, lacking control of the White House, and even uh, capturing, I think, the fewest numbers of state legislatures and state governorships at any time since 1930. So the Democratic Party doesn't have any obvious leadership. It doesn't have you know, a leader in the Congress or a leader in the states that is the obvious sort of heir apparent to the leadership of the Democratic Party. And so I think over the next few years, you're going to see a battle for the leadership of the party. Is there, would you place blame on any one faction or any one person within the party for creating this environment? Well, it's pretty hard. I mean, there's a lot of blame to go around, isn't there? So, uh, you know, on the, on the most obvious level, I think that everyone assumed that Hillary Clinton and her campaign was going to win the election against Donald Trump. And so the Clinton faction of the party bears a good deal of responsibility because if the Democrats had captured the White House, even if Republicans remained you know, in control of both houses of Congress, then we would have had pretty much status quo. We wouldn't see the values and interests of the Democratic Party you know, in such disarray as they are now. So certainly a large part of the blame, if blame it is, has to go with the Clinton campaign and their failure to win the White House, even though by all expectations beforehand, um, they had some huge advantages in being able to retain the White House. And of course, the Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections. And yet, you know, they they lost to, they lost two of those elections. And to some extent, that shows some pretty poor organization and mobilization on the level of presidential campaigns and national party organizations. But then there's plenty of blame to go around, because if you look at the level of Congress now, this was a year in which the map of Senate races really favored the Democrats, that there were a lot of states that had voted Democratic in national elections where there were relatively weak Republican candidates for Senate who had been swept in in the 2010 Tea Party uh, event that seemed vulnerable, and where the Democrats had a very good chance to win a majority in the Senate. And even though they did pick up seats, they didn't pick up enough seats there. So it seems like that you could also say that the people that ran the senatorial campaign maybe rested on their laurels and didn't really understand the dynamics and that they didn't win control of the Senate. And even if the Democrats had lost the White House and won control of the Senate, then the array of power in Washington now and what would the agenda be would be very different. So when we're talking about, let's say, um, the pending Supreme Court nomination fight over Neil Gorsuch, if the Democrats had a majority in the Senate, we would be asking some very different questions about how that was going, and maybe Gorsuch would not have been the appointment. But it's not just the presidential campaign and the National Party. It's not just the Democratic Senate campaign committee that deserves some of the blame. I think you have to look really even further down, because if you ask the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party today, it's clear that the Republicans outperform their support in the electorate, and the Democrats underperform their level of support in the electorate, and that is that the Republicans have organized better and they have exploited the structures of American politics to their advantage. So the Electoral College being the most obvious, that they were able to win the presidency even though they only won a minority of the popular vote, but also to build majorities in both houses of Congress, especially in the House of Representatives, you know, in a in a in an electorate that doesn't necessarily favor that. So if you if you compare, you know, what was the median House district, Republicans had about a two point advantage in the vote on average in House elections, whereas of course the 
the Democrats won the national popular vote by a little bit more than 2 percent. So that's a 4 or 5 percent swing, and that's due to gerrymandering and the way Congress has redistricted. And that redistricting process has benefited Republicans because they poured money, resources, effort, organization, and strategy into winning control of the state legislatures and the governorships that control congressional redistricting, whereas basically the Democratic Party was asleep at the wheel while all that was happening. Now, in their defense, they didn't have the billions of dollars that the Koch brothers and others invested in those state-level races, but still, clearly they're behind the Republicans. So there's plenty of blame to go around. Right. Sorry, that was a ra- rather long-winded answer. It's all right. I, you know, just this, this is my, my follow-up to that. Uh, I've heard a lot of people, when we spoke with, uh, with Mo Lathy and Doug High, just before the last election, they spoke about gerrymandering. But gerrymandering is a, has a long history. This is not a new thing. So could, could you explain to us how did the mo- most recent redistricting uh, of congressional districts, how, how was this different than those that came before? Well, it, uh, the fact of the matter is that, yes, gerrymandering has a long history. It goes back, in fact, to the earliest years of the republic, to Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts, for whom the name gerrymandering comes from. So it is certainly a tried and true tradition, and it is certainly within the rules of American politics. Um, so fundamentally, it hasn't changed. How this latest round of gerrymandering that happened after the 2010 elections is a little bit different is in two areas. So one is that over the past 20 years, the sophistication of information technology has made gerrymandering that was once an art into a science. And so now they have neighborhood level data so that you can really construct districts in such a way as to maximize the kinds of results you want with a level of precision and sophistication that you know, until 10 or 20 years ago, we didn't have. Now, of course, that's available to both parties. But the other thing that made this latest round different or unusual, certainly not outside of traditions, but still different and unusual, was the effort, the conscious effort, the strategy and the execution of the strategy that the Republican Party made to win control of state legislatures and governorships with the express purpose of controlling the redistricting process. So this wasn't just a side effect or a consequence of success at the state level. This was a deliberate strategy to win control of state legislatures. And most American voters, for better or worse, don't pay much attention to and turn out in lower numbers for off your elections for elections for the state legislature. And so the Republicans quite cleverly exploited that because low turnout elections favor the Republicans in our current system and high turnout elections normally favor the Democrats. And they tend to favor the Republicans because the average age of voters is much higher, correct? Yeah. So, the, I mean, the they tend... The electorate is much smaller in in off-year elections and in non-presidential elections, and so the younger people tend to vote in lower in lower numbers and participate less in those off-year elections. Minority voters tend to participate uh, less in those elections, and um, so. You know, if you sort of add the demographics together, the demographic groups that the Republicans do best in vote at higher rates in those kinds of off-year elections. So Donald Trump was elected in a populist wave, a populist explosion amongst the electorate throughout that that echo throughout the electorate. Andrew, would you say Andrew Jackson was elected? In a similar, I don't want to say, uh, of course, circumstances were different, but are there parallels between the election of Andrew Jackson and the election of Donald Trump? Well, there are some rough parallels. I mean, I think it's important to note that we do talk about Trump 
sort of feeding off a certain populist energy, and I think that's true. If by populist energy we mean a distrust of institutions as they are currently constituted, a distrust with and disgust with politicians, professional politicians and the political system, a desire for substantial change in the way elections are run and the way the American nation is governed. So in all of those senses, you can say that Trump rode a kind of populist wave, but it's important to understand, right, that that Trump only won about 46 percent of the popular vote, and he won two or three percent less of the popular vote than his main rival, Hillary Clinton. So we're really talking about, you know, an artifact of a system here, the Electoral College, which real, which means that not necessarily was it the enthusiasm of a majority that ushered him into office. And that's very different because, of course, um, uh, Andrew Jackson, when he won election, won not only the Electoral College, but also <clears throat> was the leading vote getter among the American population. And in fact, remember that Jackson had been defeated four years earlier in 1824 in the Electoral College, even though he was the leading <laughs> vote getter in the popular vote total. And I just want to point that out because we've now had five electoral college failures, five times in which the electoral vote winner and therefore the next president did not win the most actual votes from the popular vote totals. And the three cases in the 19th century all led to major changes in the political system. So when the corrupt bargain, as the Jacksonians called it, prevented Jackson from taking the presidency in, 18, in 1824, we, uh, we essentially invented the mar modern party system, a system of party conventions and nominations to ensure that you wouldn't split the electoral vote among multiple candidates as happened in 1824 and deny the presidency to the most popular candidate. After the election of 1876, we have the end of Reconstruction in the South, right. which maybe wasn't a good thing, but was a major change in the political system. After 1888, we admit a whole bunch of new states in order to prevent the kind of deadlock that had caused that result. We've now had two electoral college failures in the 21st century, 2000 and 2016, and yet nobody seems to want to make any changes. And I find that, you know, puzzling uh, in many ways to ask why that is the case. But back to your questions. Yeah, I mean, certainly Trump has fashioned himself a latter day Jackson. And in some ways, if you think about the ways that opponents of Jackson viewed him as uncouth, as not qualified for office as someone who didn't sort of respect the fundamental traditions and norms of American politics as they had been constructed at that time, then yes, you can kind of see that overlap. Of course, Jackson had had a career of public service, of military service, uh, was a military hero, um, had run for president and been the leading vote getter four years before. So in some ways, um, there are important differences. And Andrew Jackson had a lot of experience working in government before that. He had served, you know, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. He had served as at the federal level as a representative of our state before that. And he had a long history of, you know, he was a lawyer. I think sometimes people uh, underplay the degree to which he had political experience. Right, absolutely, yes. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think Trump... Trump's resume is unprecedented in that he is the first person to be elected president of the United States that has no previous experience of public service in either civilian or military life, that he came straight from the private sector into the nation's highest office. And in that way, he's very different from Jackson and even other people who, you know, were viewed as something of rubes by their opponents. Abraham Lincoln would be another example of someone who had limited 
public experience before he entered the White House, but still had, by the standards of today, fairly extensive experience. I've always been fascinated with how Martin Van Buren uh, and Andrew Jackson formed what we think of, at least in the 19th century, as the Democratic Party, the uh, the progenitor to the party that we see today. Can you talk about the birth of the Democratic Party? The Democratic Party is, I think, perhaps the best example of that old cliche that politics makes strange bedfellows, because the Democratic Party as Jackson and Van Buren created it in its modern form, you know, in the 1820s and through the 1830s, is basically a merger of or a coalition of two highly unlikely groups, and that is white Southerners and the immigrant-fueled machines of northern cities like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, etc. And for much of the history of the Democratic Party, it was this strange alliance of heavily Roman Catholic, heavily immigrant northern urban areas and the white south. And through much of the 19th century, really until the 1920s, the Democratic Party's ideological makeup perhaps resembled more the modern Republican Party than the modern Democratic Party. That is, the Democratic Party was the party of small government. It opposed what it called the high daddy, high daddy as in (laughs) D-A-D-D-Y, the paternalistic approach of the Republican Party, at least from the end of the Whig Party before the Republican Party. And we might ask, well, what did white Southerners and the immigrant machines of northern cities share in common, well, they both shared in the version to the policies being put forward by the largely native-born Protestant northern Whig and Republican parties. So whereas the white Southerners shared an aversion to the intervention of the federal government in slavery and after the Civil War in race relations and the domestic arrangements of the white South, um, uh, the sort of northern immigrant communities didn't like things like Sabbatarianism, that is, rules restricting the opening of businesses and taverns on Sundays. They didn't like um, they didn't like the forbidding parochial schools from getting public support. They didn't like temperance and other restrictions on alcoholism. They didn't like restrictions on immigration, all of the things that the Republican Party in the 19th century tended to favor. So the Democratic Party had been this odd alliance of white Southerners and northern cities for much of its history. So how does that change? How does it, you know, because this is the thing that, that, you know, a lot of people want to know. And we spoke about this in our history of the Republican Party with uh, Heather Cox Richardson. Uh, how does it change? How does the Democratic Party go from being the party of Jackson to the party of FDR and then to, you know, then to the party of Bill Clinton? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. And, of course, it's a long and complex process. And there is kind of a great reversal that takes place between the 1890s and the 1920s, a great reversal in the the nature of the coalitions and the ideological or political orientations of the two major parties. And there are two different important processes at work here. So one is a change in the very nature of political competition in the United States. And really, if you want to think about what is the major transformation in the history of American politics from the end of the 19th century to today, that is, how did we get from the era of party politics, the age of the machine, to the era of mass-mediated politics, the era of the political consultant, the political advertisement that we live in today. Because 
In the 1890s, the main ways that politicians communicated with ordinary voters and the main ways that politicians mobilized and intersected the lives of ordinary voters was through local party organizations. People were pretty much born a Republican or Democrat. Party identity rested largely on things like region, ethnicity, religion, whether or not you had served in the Union Army or your relatives had served in the Union Army, things like that, more than issues or ideologies. And elections were mostly about getting your army of loyal voters out to the polls. So you got people to the polls through things like beer, whiskey, food, (laughs) parades, uh, inspirational speakers that were more like camp meetings than they were like political rallies. Um, And in fact, it was pretty hard for people to do anything but vote the straight party line. The tickets were printed by the parties or by newspapers that tended to be partisan newspapers. So you would go to your local polling place. You would find your party's precinct captain. He would hand you a ballot. You would stuff it in the ballot. Um, you might try to stuff two or three or four into the <laughs> into the ballot box. Um, and it was almost impossible to vote anything but the straight party line because to do so, to split your ticket, you would have had to be literate. You would have to be literate in English. You would have had to cross out one name and write in another, and you would have to do it in full view of everyone. No voting booths, no secret ballot. So that all begins to change over the course of the first years of the 20th century. We get ballot reform, the widespread adoption of the so-called Australian ballot, which is where it comes from, in which you have a choice of voting for different candidates for each office. And we also, so we also then see that what comes with that are the organization of interest groups. So things like professional organizations, things like labor unions, things like business groups, religious groups, women's clubs that are now organizing and dividing the electorate in different ways besides, um, besides political party. And of course, we see the rise of a variety of national media, first in cheap magazines that are nationally circulated, then, of course, in things like film and eventually radio. So that now politicians have different ways of communicating with the electorate and mobilizing voters. And also, now that people can make choices, can ticket split, And now that party isn't fundamental to their identity and social life, you've got to start to try to win voters over. And you win voters over, you know, by by things like the personality of candidates being appealing and by making appeals on issues, offering them the kinds of policies that they favor. So all of those things, the background to the great reversal and the nature of the parties is this slow, gradual, but profound shift from the era in which parties structure every aspect of life, in which people are highly loyal to their parties, to one in which interest groups and the mass media are the main intermediaries between governors and governed, between ordinary citizens and the politicians and office holders. So over the course of the early 20th century, Things are changing within the Democratic Party, and one of the things that are changing is that that urban, immigrant, industrial working class that had been part of the coalition that Jackson and Van Buren put together is growing. So between the 1890s and World War I, 20 million immigrants come from Europe. These are largely Roman Catholic, Jewish, not Many of them are not Protestants. They're largely coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. They're almost all being inserted into the Democratic Party. And so that part of the Democratic Party, the urban industrial immigrant wing, is growing, growing much faster than the rural Protestant religious Southern and Western wing. And so in 1924, 
it comes to a head at the Democratic National Convention, which is held in unair conditioned Madison Square Garden in New York during a heat wave. And it lasts for 17 days because the party is locked between its two leading candidates, William McAdoo, who represents the southern western dry that is in favor of prohibition, religious, small government part of the party, and Al Smith, the Irish Catholic governor of New York State, who represents that immigrant northern wing that Van Buren had brought into the party, and that increasingly now is skeptical of the anti-government, small government, religious inclinations of that Democratic Party, because now they are a largely industrial working class and they want protections from the ravages of the modern industrial economy. They are also wets. They are opponents of prohibition, and they are also opponents of the KKK and immigration restriction and other efforts that sort of go against the increasing ethnic diversity of the country. We're having a lot of um, discussion in the country about immigration now. And uh, mm -hmm. there seems to be a parallel. Do you see a parallel between that time and this time? I know it's a little different. There's definitely an, an immigration backlash, and it's focused in the Republican Party. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the Republican Party had, you know, certainly at the end of the 1800s and into the early years of the 20th century – was the party where desire to restrict immigration, where fear of immigration's effect on American economic life and also especially on American culture, that somehow America was losing its white Anglo-Saxon Protestant DNA, that it was somehow being corrupted by these millions of immigrants with different religion, different ethnicity, different customs and food and so on, that the Republican Party had a strong push for restriction. What's interesting, though, is in the early years of the 20th century, they couldn't get restriction passed. So Republicans introduced restriction laws in every, every session of Congress from the 1890s until they finally succeeded during and after World War I. But they couldn't succeed, and they couldn't succeed in part because the Democrats always opposed immigration restrictions. So, in right. fact, when the Literacy Test Act passed in 1917, which was the first successful restriction measure, it passed over the veto of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson vetoed that law not because he was sympathetic to immigrants or immigration – in fact, he sort of personally did not much like immigrants, or at least was right. uncomfortable around them. But he was a Democrat, and the Democratic Party wasn't going to strangle its own lifeblood, which was, of course, the immigrant-fueled cities of the North. But – so you had the Democrats who blocked immigration restriction, and the Republicans were lukewarm about it because the Republicans were the party of business, and business liked the flow of cheap labor. But during and after World War I, the Republicans finally succeed in getting immigration restriction. And in 1924, when the Republicans control the White House and both houses of Congress, they are able to enact the National Origins Act, sometimes called the Johnson Weed Act, which of course set up quotas severely restricting immigration from places like Southern in Eastern Europe and really cut off mass immigration to the United States for two generations, between 1924 when the quota system came in and 1965 when Lyndon Johnson got rid of the quota system with immigration reform. That's the period in which immigration has less and less influence on American life as opposed to any time before or since. And yet these are years in which predominantly the Democrats do well. 
even though they lose they lose the base that they saw in the in, in immigrants does do they realize they have to adjust is that what happened they realize they have to adjust now that they can't rely on the immigration what happened is that roosevelt is able to expand the democratic coalition at its heart still are immigrants or not immigrants themselves but white ethnics largely roman catholic and jewish uh, people of immigrant stocks, the children and grandchildren of immigrants. And remember, you had those 20 million immigrants, and they, they continue to have children. So it's their descendants are at the heart of that coalition. But Roosevelt adds to the Democratic coalition African Americans, who had long been loyal to the party of Lincoln. But now, because of a few symbolic steps of outreach during the 1930s, but mostly because of the ways that Roosevelt's New Deal made available economic benefits to African Americans. He brings African Americans into the Democratic coalition. And then, of course, another key element in expanding that coalition is labor, organized labor. As the New Deal sort of brings organized labor into American public life as a full partner whose interests are protected by the federal government and that adds another element to the Democratic Party coalition. And that also, is it fair to say, lays the foundation for losing the South, correct? Because by bringing in the black Americans and bringing in organized labor, this really alienates that, that Southern Democratic coalition. It does. And certainly, you know, but I think it's very important to avoid a too simplistic picture of why it is that the solid democratic South, you know, becomes, as it is today, a solid Republican white South. Because it would be wrong to say that it was backlash against the Democratic Party's support for civil rights in the 1960s that was at the heart of it. And I think your question, which ties together support for civil rights with support for organized labor gets at the complex process quite better than the standard idea that the Democratic Party supported civil rights and the white South deserted it. That's a story. Um, we tell that often. There's a famous story about Lyndon Johnson being depressed in his office on the day after he signed the Civil Rights Act, the great triumph of his career. And the young Bill Moyers goes in and says, you know, Mr. President, why are you sad? And he says, we've just lost the South for your for my lifetime and yours. It wasn't that simple, because even though in 1964, four deep South states do desert the Democratic Party, white Southerners remain Democratic in non-presidential races into the 1980s. And when the South goes Republican, the places that go Republican first are not in the deep South, but are on the periphery of the South, are in places like Virginia, Texas, um, uh, you know, North Carolina. Um, and really, there are two processes that are going on at the same time. One is backlash against the civil rights movement, but the other is the economic development of the South and the urbanization of the South, the creation of the so-called Sunbelt South, which brings into the South a generation of white Republicans that look kind of like white Republicans in other parts of the country. So there are, there are those two processes going on simultaneously. And that's where I think your point about labor is so important, that opposition to labor was as much a reason for white Democrats in the South to give up on the Democratic Party, on the party of the fathers, as they called it, and become Republicans. Right. So you have with it, you have once again, migration, even though it is internal migration, being essential to understanding this shift as well. Absolutely. So if you look at a place like uh, Cobb County, Georgia, which is the northern suburbs of Atlanta, that was the headquarters for Newt Gingrich when he was in the House and became Speaker of the House. Well, if you look at how Cobb County voted in 1960, yeah, it voted all Democratic. And if you look at how Cobb County voted in 
in 2000, it had become a Republican stronghold. But to say that Cobb County switched from one to another misses the story because Cobb County in 1960 was a sparsely populated rural farming county. Cobb County in 2000 is a suburb highly developed with many more people, and it is no longer a farming area. It is a it's an in suburb of metropolitan Atlanta, and most of the people who live in Cobb County did not grow up in Georgia even. So to say, oh, people in Cobb County or in similar areas of the South switch from one party to another misses the process in which actually it's different people. that Now there's internal migration, so you have a kind of different people, and that's especially true in the metropolitan South. In places like Nashville or Atlanta or the Research Triangle of North Carolina or uh, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth, a lot of internal migration. The, the past couple of months, I've been thinking a lot about George McGovern and the Democratic Party in the wake of his crushing landslide defeat to Richard Nixon in 1972. Uh, talk a little bit about the party at that point and how they began to uh, to find themselves. Uh, maybe a similar situation to what they're in today. That's a great question. I mean, the the Democratic Party in 1972 was at the beginning of the transformation from the party of Lyndon Johnson and big city machines, people like Chicago Mayor Richard Daley or Vice President Hubert Humphrey or AFL-CIO President George Meany. That's what the Democratic Party looked like through the 1950s and 60s. It was still the Roosevelt coalition. And at the end of the 60s, the turmoil of the 60s led to a transformation of the Democratic Party. And after the disaster of 1968, the Democratic Party changed its rules. It opened up its presidential selection process. It deliberately included not only more young people, but more women and more minorities in decision making. And George McGovern, who in fact had been the first chairman of the commission that changed the party's rules, it was known as the McGovern Fraser Commission. He actually dropped off that commission when he decided to run for president himself, was the first person to exploit this new Democratic Party, the so-called new politics constituencies, young people, minorities, women, people who were interested in environmentalism, people who were interested in cultural issues, not so much interested in the bread and butter sort of labor and management politics of the previous generation of Democrats. Now, in 1972, McGovern's coalition of sort of people around university campuses, high-tech areas, plus minorities, well, that was a tiny coalition, and he was crushed, and the Democratic Party was in disarray. But if you think of the Democratic Party of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, it is essentially the McGovern coalition, highly educated white who are interested mostly in cultural issues and environmentalism and questions of identity, of racial justice, social justice, plus minorities, and not so much the lunchbox working class union Democrats who had been at the heart of the Roosevelt coalition. The thing is, by 2008, you could build a majority with, that, with the old McGovern coalition, which you couldn't in 1972. So those we think of as the Reagan Democrats began to break away from the Democratic Party during the the McGovern era. Yeah. So all those people that we think of as the, you know, the people that Nixon called the silent majority, who we then called the Reagan Democrats, who are then perhaps those same Trump voters in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania, who voted for Obama in 2008 but voted for Trump, white working class workers concerned about trade, concerned about job security, um, concerned about immigration. Yeah, those are the descendants of Richard Nixon's silent majority in 1972, who will become the Reagan Democrats in 1980 and 84. It blows my mind to think about all the people that voted for Obama in Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin that voted for Trump. The same people 
that voted for Obama voted for Trump. It just, can you, do you have any um, speculation on that? Any understanding of how that happened? Well, I have to confess it blows my mind, too, because it doesn't sort of fit (laughs) our conventional picture of how political identity works. But clearly, there are a large number of voters who are dissatisfied with the status quo, and they want to choose the candidate that they think stands outside the status quo and that's going to shake that's going to shake things up. And so I think that is, you know, that's the only way that you can make make sense of that. The other way that you can make sense of it goes back to the very first question you asked about, well, who in the Democratic Party deserves blame for the current situation that they find themselves in? And it, you know, it does seem clear that the National Democratic Party took for granted voters in places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and didn't make all that good an effort to reach out for them. The Clinton campaign didn't campaign once in Wisconsin. It didn't go to Michigan until the last week of the campaign, while it spent lots of time and resources in places like Arizona and Texas, where they were highly unlikely to win. But yes, I think I'm as baffled by that as you are. Bruce Shulman, thank you so much for your time. We hope that you uh, come back another time. And fascinating to think about where the Democratic Party is today and uh, the journey it took to get here. Yes, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us today on The Road to Now. Our show is produced by Bob Crawford, Ben Sawyer, and Ian Scotta. Bob Crawford edited today's program. Our music's provided by Paul DeFiglia. We appreciate all your comments on iTunes. Please remember to like us on Facebook. And for more information on the show, please visit theroadtonow.com. Until next time, for Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care.